Oliver Sutter. So, thank you very much. There's a lot of expectation right now. Oh my, okay. So, I'd like to keep it simple here. So, I want to give you now a little introduction into the old folklore, into the uh, folk magic, the old uh, folk music, pagan myths of the old north, especially Sweden, some, some Norway in here. And I want to do this while introducing you to the old uh, stories, legends, but also uh, by playing with my Mura Harper. This is my partner in crime for tonight. It's a key fiddle, a Swedish instrument. And um, it, there was, they found one instrument similar to this in the 16th century in a moor in uh, Sweden. And it was kind of forgotten. And then there was a, a famous painter in Sweden. His name is Anders Zorn. And he, uh, his mission was not only to paint very beautiful, but also to bring back the old uh, folk tradition of Sweden back to life. And so he did many things, and among them was he had a little museum for the old folklore. And in this museum, he uh, exhibited also this instrument found in the moor. And uh, this museum was in a very small town called Mura. And this is where the name comes from, so it's a Mura Harper. And I want to play now um, three different folk tunes combined to each other for you, so you know how it sounds. Thank you very much. 
Is it still a little soft? Can we have it louder, maybe? Do you think louder? Or was it good down there? Louder, okay. Make it louder. You know it's the hangover day, so it's day number four today. <laughs> Otherwise, they all fall asleep. <laughs> yes, now we go. Okay, so. Okay, but first we go on with the lecture. So, uh, you are of course, you have, can imagine nowadays still Sweden has a very little population, Norway even less people on a very large country. And back then, of course, nature had a very, very strong impact on the people. Just imagine there was maybe a big thunderstorm coming, destroying all the crops, and the people were really afraid to starve to death in wintertime. So nature had a strong power, and with this came a certain also honoring of nature. And this is a very healthy, I think. So it's a thing I want to talk a lot today is animism. So animism means that you believe that everything around you is alive, and this is a very healthy belief system. And back then, it was still very common to think like this. Like in the in the stones, there were not only stones; they were alive. There were trolls living inside the stones. And also, if you go, uh, for example, the water in Scandinavia, the water was alive. There was a water spirits living in uh, ponds, rivers, little waterfalls. And these were called Strömkalen, or also a Nöcken. And this Nöcken, it was said that if you listen very closely, for example, that you could hear them making music, because they're very good at making music. And... Um, also, some of them are very good fiddle players and also key fiddle players. And so it is said that if you gave the right donation, you could go to the Nöcken and they teach you melodies and they teach you how to play the violin or the harpa really good. And so it's also said that you, like, um, you have the right donation, you have the right attitude towards them, but also there are certain rules. For example, you have to play that long in the teaching lesson until your fingers started to bleed. But if you did it right, they say it's uh, very possible that the water and the waterfall is flowing ups, up, upwards again, that um, the fish are jumping out of the, the, the river, and the trees um, are becoming, uh, starting to dance. So it's very magical music that's possible. And much later on, famous fiddle players in Sweden, they were also sometimes used uh, to, for the reputation to, to keep the middle down. So say, you are playing that good, this is not normal. You went to the Nöcken and learned it there. So it was not always a compliment also. And so the uh, next uh, combination of two Polskars, two dances, the second one is called a Nöcken's Polska. So that means uh, that pretty much for sure, this one was brought to human kind to, to the humans by a Nöcken, by a water spirit. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And if we are talking about this instrument, it's like I should not forget to mention one person because you have to imagine this instrument is called a Mura Harper, but the whole family of instrument is called a Nickel Harper or Key Fiddle in English. And uh, in the 1950s, there were in the whole world, there was only 17 people left who played this instrument. And all of them were living in a very small town, uh, place in Sweden called Uppland. And maybe there's a high potential that this instrument might have died out if not one person came along. And he um, was a really good fiddle player. And then he discovered this instrument and he started to play it. But he also started to build it and made it a little more modern, gave it different uh, rows of keys so you could also play in different keys and contemporary music on it. And he played it really well. And so it became very popular back then. And he started to build a lot of instruments, and um, so this led to a little renaissance of this instrument, and maybe because of this one man it survived to until nowadays. And he was not only as Erik Salström is his name, and Erik Salström, he lived from 1912 to 1986, so pretty contemporary. And um, he did not only play very well, he also was a good composer, and he composed one March, that is his most famous piece. And this is about a sad history of Swedish, a sad a part of Swedish history. Because in the, it was 1719, I think, the Swedish army, they, they invaded Norway, but they were defeated and they had to retreat. And on the way back, there came a terrible snowstorm in deep winter. And while they were retreating and traveling north Sweden, most of them died in that snowstorm. And due to this very sad occasion, this uh, famous man, Erik Salström, he wrote the Marsch of the Carolina, the Carolina Marschen, and this I'm going to play now for you.
thank you. And you can imagine that music was very important in the old days. Like there was not much television <laughs> or distraction. So even nowadays, there's a lot of music in Sweden that's very beautiful because the winters are simply very long and very dark. And um, but back then, music was had a very very important role in society. But also there was a lot of uh, Christian puritanism, so very very straight rules, and. Um, that led, for example, to a crazy uh, law that, for example, in the 17th century, that drums were totally forbidden in Sweden, so you were not allowed to play drums. And this was also a little, a little link to the Zami people, to the indigenous people, of course, because for them, a drum was not an instrument. A drum was a totem. A drum was a horse. And with that horse, on the, with the galloping of the horse, the beating of the drum, they could ride into the other world. And um, so they were so connected to the drum that it was said if the skin had a scratch or it was about to break, they were seriously afraid about their health because they were very much connected. So, um, but that was forbidden, totally forbidden, for many, many, many years. And the peak of this Christian Puritanism was even that fiddle music was forbidden. So in the um, 1850s, fiddle music was uh, totally forbidden and then it became more relaxed again. But, um, for example, for many, many uh, decades and even more than 100 years, fiddle players were not allowed to play in churches. And um, it's very strange because uh, at most of the weddings, a fiddle player was invited and was playing for, for the evening and he played the bridal marches to the church, but then he had to stop at the, at the church door and were not allowed to play inside. So the bridal marches became a big thing back then. So, um, and there was always this strong connection between fiddle music and between the little devilish aspects. So, uh, the key fiddle players, the nickel harper players, uh, there's a lot of um, strange leather sacks were found in old instruments. And inside the sacks were mostly a small bone. And now they found out that this was the, uh, one of the finger bones of a very good player of the nickel harper. And why, because they had these leather bags inside the instrument as a totem, it was said the gift of playing would be better. And even more obscure, for example, you find old violins from, from Scandinavia, and they have a very strange holes in the front. And then they tried many years of research, like, it, it, does it change the sound? Is it, is, it, is it for the sound? And now they found out, no, the sound is not changed by this. But it was a, it was a belief that if the player started to play really wild and was really getting into the mood that the devil was in the violin. And they were afraid that the devil was stuck inside the violin and they took it home. So this was the whole why playing for the devil to escape the violin again. Yes. You, well. So um, now I play a Polska for you, a very small one. Um, it's called the Hins Polska. And Hin is, um, means, it uh, comes from Hin Hale, and this is a name for the devil. So this is the devil's Polska. And I play this because it's very strange for us. It's a major tune, so it's very friendly. But back then, major was more the harder key. M minor was more the soft, s smoothening key. And um, yes, it says this Polska had about 12 parts, but people were too afraid to write all the 12 parts down. So only Two parts are written down, and this is what I play for you. The rest you have to make up in your head, maybe. Thank you. 
Thank you. And most of the dances I play here, they're uh, polskor. This is a plural, a single that would be polska. And it's a very famous traditional folk dance in Sweden. It's mostly, not always, but mostly in a three, four bar, and it's like a waltz. But it's nice, it's danced in couples. And I had the honor also to, to do it still in uh, Stemma, in this traditional folk meetings in Sweden. Uh, it's, it's the comment that the uh, Spielmann, the musician, is sitting in the middle and the dancers are dancing in a circle around him. And so it's very, very important to be in sync, to know the right speed for the right dancers, and to also have the feeling when the people are getting tired. So saying this, there's an old story, because also the Polska, because people were really going for it back then, had a little reputation of being a little devilish dance. And for example, there's one legend of the people of Horga. Horga was a small town in uh, Sweden that they were meeting in the barn of, of the village for the, for the dance, for the dance evening. And then um, there was a strange man, all undressed, appearing, and people were well, well, still went on dancing, but at a certain point he asked the fiddle player if he could borrow the fiddle and if he's allowed to play a little bit. And people said, yeah, of course, you can play. And he played very, very beautiful. So uh, all the people started to dance and jump up, and it was very beautiful. And then he played even more beautiful, and the people were dancing very, very jollyful. And he played more beautiful, and people got a little exhausted, but then they realized they could not stop dancing anymore. And he played on and on and on. People got really exhausted, and he played even on. And people started to get really sick, and people started to die. And he played on and on, until in the end of that very long night, there was the fiddle player standing in the middle of the room, and only skeletons dancing around him in a circle. So, the good old days. So I, I tried to imitate this a little bit. <laughs> Don't be afraid, um, because it was, it's really part of this uh, folk tradition that it's, there's no drums, there's still no drums in Sweden somehow, but uh, it's the wooden floors of the barns or folk meeting halls, and they make the beat, so you're drumming with the, you, the drum is the beating of the dancers. So I have this little device here, and I just try to imitate how it might have sounded back then with a, a Polska from very north of Sweden now. I switch the drum on, I hope I won't die, wait, that's good. Thank you. 
thank you. And now I come to a very last piece for you. And this is a very modern song because uh, actually I wrote it myself uh, five years ago. But, and it's called Hagatsusa. And for those who don't know, it's, a, it's an old German word. And Hagatsusa means, uh, it derives from a word called Haag. And Haag is the hedge. And this hedge was the, um, the um, it was dividing the place where the humans were living, the middle of the village, for example, with the outside world, with the, with the nature. And it was pretty dangerous back then, maybe. Depends where you were living. And so this was, um, it was a little, um, yeah, this strange place, this in-between two worlds. And then there were wise old women or wise women who went into this in-between world to, uh, for example, to travel between the worlds, but also to pick herbs. Haag is also there was for, for Hawthorne was a plan growing there a lot. So, and later on from this word Hagatsusa, which means the one who's sitting on the hedge on this in-between world, later on derives the word Hexe, a German word for witch. And so yes, so this is a song dedicated to all these wise women who were traveling in between the worlds for us. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, 
I hope that you had a l good little insight into this uh, world of folk magic, folklore, that it was very much alive. And I really hope that um, you have the little uh, wish now to dive a little bit deeper into this old uh, folk beliefs, because I strongly believe that they help us to get a more animistic ourselves again, and to think that there is maybe a water spirit living in the water, and this helps us to honor the world around us much more and to hopefully protect it also. So take this home. Thank you so much. And there's CDs over here, by the way. <coughs>